Welcome to the Ethics Experts, where we're elevating ethics and compliance and HR to the strategic level it's supposed to be. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Ethics Experts. If it's your first time joining us, welcome. And if you are a, a returning subscriber, hey, how's it going? What's up, friend? You see what happens when you subscribe to the Ethics Experts? You get a bonus greeting on every episode. Absolute no-brainer to hit that subscribe button. I am here with the man, Ludovic Raptus. How you doing, bud? Very good. And you, Nick? Good, man. Really excited to get you on. So you are someone I've been following on LinkedIn for a while. You're a compliance thought leader. You're global. You, you're super passionate. Uh, it's full of ideas and really excited to get you on here to kind of pick your brain on your story, where, uh, where this industry is going, what you see around the curve, and just to kind of hang out for a while. So welcome, man. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Nick. Yeah. So let's, uh, where, are you, where, where are you at right now? I, I'm, I'm talking to you uh, from the south of France. Oh, beautiful. Between Aix-en-Provence and Marseille. <laughs> oh, amazing. See, this is we got an international podcast now. This is great. Yes. So uh, let's just dive right in. What first set you on a path toward a career in, in compliance? Yeah, I, it's a bit of, um, yeah, it wasn't planned at all. Um, I graduated uh, from an MBA in corporate finance, started my career in, in England and in France. And I was um, working as a CFO. Um, and then I, I entered um, this, this company um, where um, compliance was, was a very, very important topic because of the um, compliance breach that happened uh, mm -hmm. in the past. And it was so important that uh, the CFO uh, took it very, very personally and, and built a very strong compliance system wow what um, kind of a company was it um it's um it's infinite technologies it's a semiconductor company got it uh, based in munich um yeah based in munich uh, and this is uh, at the dax 30. Mm -hmm. okay and as many companies uh we had uh compliance breach in the past yeah and, and the cfo um, member of the board took it very personally and and decided to to implement a strong compliance system and hire um, a team, a global team, and then a regional team. And because he was a CFO, mm -hmm. he, he said uh, that, that uh, head of finance from different uh, countries should be compliance ambassador. Or, Interesting. Okay, because the, team, the global team, the global compliance team was so small that they needed some help to, to support the, the program. And, and I was a head of finance in France. So that's how I started my journey in, uh, in compliance. So that's pretty interesting, right? It's pretty interesting for yeah. a CFO to kick this off. And I mean, I've had a, hundreds of these kinds of conversations. I've never heard of this term of a compliance ambassador at the CFO level. It usually feels like uh, the compliance department is trying to convince the CFO that, hey, we need some more budget and we need to make these investments. What was that like having that dictate from, from that executive level? How did you see these compliance ambassadors start to drive more compliance in their little corners of the world? Um, the thing is, um, in many, uh, so we were a global organization, okay? And sometimes with very small offices, and on those, in these offices you could have some salespeople, uh, maybe one HR representative, maybe one managing director, and always somebody taking care of finance. And we we would call that CFO or head mm -hmm. of finance. Mm -hmm. And it, it was decided to ask the finance representative to help on compliance because. Having the managing directors was not a good idea uh -huh. because first um, person might be too busy to do it, or um, it would be better to have some kind of a counter power or the uh -huh. managing director to help on, on, on compliance. And HR wasn't an option. And most of the time on those small legal entities, there's no um, nobody working for legal. So the only uh, I would say support function or the most, uh, the well, the, uh, the best choice would be the head of 
finance. Awesome. Interesting. So yeah. this is put on you. You you become a de facto compliance am- ambassador uh, yeah. in your office. And then what? Exactly. Exactly. And then we, I, so that was, of course, a brand new for me. Even if topic like corruption, everybody knows about corruption. So, yeah. so I started to, to be, to have this role and understanding um, um, what was uh, asked um, by, by the global team and, and what was asked to me, uh, I can summarize it in uh, pretty uh, briefly, was to be the eyes and the ears of the global compliance team for, for, my, for my office in France. So to be the eyes and ears for the global compliance team. So what did that force you to start to look at that you weren't looking at before? And how did you, how did you develop a good ear and develop a good eye for the types of things you were supposed to be tuned into? Um, when I was head of finance, uh, I was very focused on accounting and financials and, and forecasts. And with this compliance hat of compliance ambassador that I've been given, I had to broaden my, my skill set. First of all, I had to, to learn uh, all the local rules or legal rules in terms of corruption, in terms of whistleblowing hotline in terms of um, workplace misconduct. Um, I had also to dive into the business model of the, of the company, even though it was something I knew, but just having this compliance hat, um, I had to, to dive into topic that I didn't know before. Oh, I knew them, but it was, that wasn't my priority. Like, right. for instance, um, meeting with competitors when you have the discussion with competitors and which uh, and uh, and teachers risk that can raise so so those type of topics that i was not paying too much attention for before um, were brought to my attention thanks to this role you know what's interesting is you know this is not the case all over the place absolutely not the case in your organization but many times there's this sort of like sibling rivalry between compliance and finance, right? Uh, compliance doesn't know how to talk to finance. They don't know how to persuade them to get what they need. Finance sometimes thinks compliance is a cost center and is something that, you know, is just a drag on the business and so forth. But I think what you just underscored here is something pretty interesting is that you becoming that compliance ambassador for your organization, given your background in accounting and finance and just, you know, corporate finance, whatever, you really, you really have an eye for this stuff already because as you come up through, uh, you know, accounting, for example, you're learning all of these accounting principles that apply across these different businesses and so forth. Those, that principle-based approach can, tr- you know, translate into many different scenarios. And as you're, you know, as you're building financial models and so forth, there's so many little details that you have to consider and assumptions and all that kind of stuff. It's like finance has a good mind for compliance as it is. And it's interesting to see this uh this synergy created in somebody like yourself who's again very very passionate about this thing but to see that that this isn't oil and water this is something that's very complementary and it sounds like you took to it very quickly yeah um no that's very interesting yes i took it very quickly um one one, because this question came up uh, so much to me because i um now i'm the one nominating compliance ambassador so i'm the one talking to head of finance, you're going to be, you're going to help me on compliance. And most of the time I've got like those big eyes saying, why me? Right. And, and, and the, the answer I give them is the good thing with accounting and, and finance and controlling is any single decision, which is being made in a company is at some point being translated into numbers. Yeah. Right. Um, anything. So whether it's a fine, uh, whether it's uh, somebody being terminated and you need to pay a severance or a vendor, which is being selected um, or an entertainment event being thrown Mm -hmm. uh, or somebody trying to bribe somebody else, uh, there's an expense behind. Um, So, so that's how I convinced, I said, yeah, you are head of finance. You, uh, this will impact you, uh, in the beginning or at the end, but this will impact you for sure. 
And what were those conversations like? You know, you, you just mentioned that sometimes they have these wide eyes. How do you get them to shrink those eyes and get less anxious about whatever you're talking about? Um, so this first argument, the second one is, um, I'm, I'm a big fan of fraud prevention. Okay. So when, when I come and speak to head of finance and I told them, look, if you take uh, this role um, seriously and you give the impression to your employees that you are looking at what they are doing. Mm. So this detection uh, feeling will make people being very careful, okay? And will make, uh, will might end up with, um, have less fraud and less and m- much more savings. Like I can give you some example. Um, for instance, an employee that wants to, to travel uh, first class, but he, he or she is not allowed to. Okay, and he or she find a way to, to travel first class and, and, and pay um, uh, a $4,000 uh, ticket instead of a couple of hundred tickets. If, if this person knows that the head of finance is looking into that, mm-hmm. then this person will be less likely to, to, to commit a fraud. So that's another, I would say, argument that I would give to my finance colleague. Yeah, it's a I good mean, way to make savings. Yeah, it's creating a disincentive for fraud because you know somebody capable and smart and who is numbers minded is going to be, for lack of a better term, they're going to be policing that expense report that you're turning in. So you better not kind of color outside of the lines. Um, so you kind of took to this like a duck to water. You found uh, an interesting sort of complementarity between your finance background and the compliance background as you were getting your feet on the ground. How did you start to look at the world and see opportunities for more impact uh, within your organization? So this happens naturally because I was offered um, to be this time head of compliance for a whole uh, region. So the Americas region, which is uh, USA, Mexico and, and Brazil. Oh, wow. So, so I transitioned from a finance role to a compliance dedicated role. Cool dealing with compliance and internal control mainly. So that, that happened just naturally. Yeah. And so as you, as you stepped into that role, at what point was it very clear to you that you were a quote unquote compliance professional or person? When, yeah. when did that light bulb come on and say in, in your heart, you said, I'm home. This is what I need to be doing. Okay. I'm, um, I'm a people person. And what I really like in life is knowing why people are taking decisions. So it can be their upbringings, can be their environment, can be their, their, their work, their family, the situations. And I, I like that, and, and I like to, to, to understand, analyze why people are taking decisions. And compliance, um, it's, it's, a people, it's a people job. You can have the best system, but at the end of the day, it's uh, human beings taking decisions. Right. When I, I had that light bulb, when I, um, I was invited to, um, uh, to uh, interview an employee during um, one of our uh, work. Mm-hmm. And um, so we knew already what was the, uh, the facts, but we wanted to understand why yeah. this person did something wrong at this moment. And listening to that person, understanding his uh, personal financial struggle, um, uh, his life, um, uh, how he sees his work, I, I just realized that that was for me because um, there's no bad or, or, or wrong person. It's just a situation. Yeah, right. Okay. And so that was um, a moment where I understood, yeah, that's that's uh, job is for me listening, understanding, and yeah, listening and understanding people. So as you look back on your previous role, which again, yeah. I'm going to kind of, you know, which was all numbers essentially. Yeah. Do you, in retrospect, see that there was a missing piece to that job that wasn't giving you the fulfillment or that wasn't giving you an opportunity to release your gifts? And did you, so, and if so, also, when you were back in that in that role, did you feel like there was a missing piece to it? Yeah, definitely. Um, 
I really like my role in finance and, and legal and tax. I think it's when you take it seriously, there's a lot, a lot, a lot to do and I really like it. Um, but what I missed is, um, first, uh, the innovation, I think in compliance, it's, it's a pretty uh, new uh, topic. Um, and there's a lot of innovation to be done still uh, around data analytics, and we'll talk about it, mm -hmm. around training, around uh, investigation. There's so much that still needs to be done. So I, and so I missed this, this innovation part. Right. Um, I, I think I also missed uh, the, how to grab people's attention. Yeah. And it's a, it's a job where you talk a lot to a lot of different persons. And the, 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 the good thing, at least for, for me, is that you talk to so many departments, uh, to so many people that are just doing things that are so different, especially in large organization. Right. Um, yeah, it's your day is never the same. Uh, and it's, yeah, you always every day you you're learning uh, new, new processes, new people, new risk, right? Uh, that's, that's what I was missing before. So I love talking to people like you that are passionate about this and that are excited about the role that ethics and compliance can have in an organization. Um, you know, you bring a lot of energy to it. And, you know, I think a lot of people are not all, of course, but a, a lot of people feel a little bit downtrodden in the in these positions because they're viewed as a cost center and they don't have the power within their organization that they'd like to really make the impact that they think the organization needs. Um, but I love how you've kind of reframed that as you stepped into this new role coming from a kind of finance, which was a little bit more, for lack of a better term, like an inch, a little bit more of an introverted role, a little bit more of a heads down, staring at a spreadsheet kind of role, which again, there's interesting things in that, right? Uh, there's interesting aspects of how, you know, can I get this this thing to balance. I have, uh, you know, I kind of came out of accounting, accounting and, fi and finance as well. So a lot of yeah. what you talk about really resonates with me because the people element to this game that we're in is super interesting and it's a game of persuasion. And as you talked, you know, again, to your point, as you talk to these different people throughout the organization, it's almost like, uh, you get to see a lot more of the dimensionality of the business. You can see things from different perspectives that standing, you know, sitting behind a spreadsheet and looking at the manifestation of that business on that two dimensional screen you're looking at, uh, can that can never capture getting out there and talking to folks leads to, again, a lot of, uh, a lot of dynamics that can drive innovation because you see opportunities and you see how people are thinking and you see how people are actually processing the incentives that they're presented with within the corporate structure or within their corner of, of the world. So a lot of what you talked about really resonated with me. And I think it's, it, you probably bring a, a really interesting mix of, uh, of abilities to the role with this finance analytical background that because you're a people person can greatly complement the ultimate input, you know, and magnify the impact that you're having in your company. Yeah. Yeah. Totally agree. And, and, um, and to make again, a, a link between um, compliance and finance, I, I took my certified fraud examiner certification. Oh, wow. Which is a, a pure, uh, I would say audit. Yeah. Um, I would say a skill set or certification, and it's um, it's good because I, I I had naturally the people aspect. I'm a people person, so everything that relates to workplace misconduct or yeah. workplace issues, I can deal with that naturally. But I've got also this fraud and aspects, and and to be honest, my, the when you have an accounting or auditing background like, like you, you just understand the mechanics. Right. You can understand. You understand just the mechanics and the impact on the financials and where people want 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 to, want to do. Um, so it's it's I think I think to be honest, it's a good combination. Yeah, I think it's a great combination. And you know, if you're a doctor, great. If you're a lawyer, great. If you're a doctor and a lawyer, that's a super powerful combination. You know, yeah. and you see this kind of synergy when people have these diverse backgrounds who come into this game. And you know, thank God that finally. Uh, the archetype of what people are looking for seems to change 
or seems to have changed over the years. Whereas before it was like, you just need to be a lawyer if you're going to be in compliance. Well, that's a great background for it for, for sure. <laughs> but I think as organizations recognize that there's a lot, there's a lot of different backgrounds that can add a ton of value to the compliance, you know, to the compliance department. Um, it opens up a lot of opportunities for different people to come in and let their gifts be released. Agree. So when you, what do you focus on as, as a leader in terms of, you know, developing people or, uh, being a carrier of culture, uh, within your organization? Um, inside my team, for instance, or in general? Well, I'd like to hear about both pieces, both in terms of your team, which are the folks that you can probably affect most readily and most quickly, but then also as you think about the broader organization and driving change across these group of people that are in different locations in different countries and jurisdictions and so forth, what kind of connection points do you have between that, you know, the leadership, uh, you know, manifestation in both of these realms? Okay. Um, let's start by how do I how do I connect with with leadership? Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Now I'll give you my my view about um, how to lead a team. One, if I if I can uh, nail one little thing, uh, not little actually, a big thing that needs to to do as a company is understand the business. Mm -hmm. I think it's key. And when I hear either auditors or companies that just uh, would uh, lecture people without understanding the business, uh, the value flow, who are the customers, who mm -hmm. are the vendors, what are the pressure points, what is the strategy of the company? Yeah. If you if you if you do not understand that really really well, um, especially in large organization, I think um, uh, top management will not listen to you. Right. And why um, do you think they, that is? Why? Um, because um, there's in again in large organization. There's a um, when you are a manager, you have a lot of things, and topic, and time mm -hmm. to spare on on tasks that are not your core business. Okay, if you are a head of sales, your job is to sell. Okay, mm -hmm. but you need to deal with HR policies, to legal policies to how uh, to facility management policies and at some point um you you just do it you tick the box and you just don't pay attention so if 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 a compliance professional do not understand the business and don't talk the same language to the head of sales then the person uh will listen to you one minute two minutes and then will just do what what you have what you ask them to do and then that's it if you if you can engage and the best is engage and find a common ground yeah. where your objective as compliance is the same objective as 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 a head of sales then that's the best totally. then your compliance uh program will be will be driven by the head of sales and that's that's for me uh the this is what i'm i'm looking for that's the best yeah, I mean, we talk a lot about crowdsourcing risk management, and we paint this picture often of compliance being the goalie uh, on a football field. And yeah. you can make it all the way to the World Cup. Do you like how I called it football instead of soccer? I did that for you, buddy. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, you can make it all the way to the end of the World Cup and make it to the finals, but if you let that last goal by, you're blamed and you're dragged in the streets and your name is dragged in the mud, irrespective of the fact that you blocked all those other shots that allowed the, the team to get to the finals. You, you know what I'm saying? So yeah. the best goalies are the ones who have the best defenders. That's my theory. And to your point, when you can start to crowdsource risk management, meaning you can let the crowd of people, the crowd of managers or other leaders in your organization pick up the banner that you're trying to carry and carry that forward themselves in their corner of the world or with the teams that they're over, then the odds of a, of a goal getting, you know, uh, the odds of a goal being scored or something getting past the goalie is greatly diminished. But to your point, yeah. you have to stay coordinated with those defenders and you have to, again, to your point, make sure that those defenders are aligned in terms of, hey, our job is to stop these goals. The interesting piece is that many, many people, again, not all, uh, many people or like the low end uh, chief compliance or the low end compliance officers who walk around with a hammer uh, and say, well, this is what you should do. And they, they're, you know, pointing their finger in the face of the salesperson. They don't get a lot of traction and they don't get a lot of uh, benefit from this smart person, presumably, who's in a position who could be an ally and could actually help do, you know, make their lives easier. 
Um, I love this approach that you're taking of finding common ground, speaking their language. And what we're talking about is not only in what we call an other's focus, focusing on the other person instead of focusing on myself. Um, yeah. we're, we're talking not only about an, an, an other's focus, but we're also talking about speaking their language, right? Like if you can't speak their language, you just end up losing a ton of credibility. And if you don't have mm -hmm. any credibility and the person looking at you across the table thinks that you're an idiot, the odds of you of them doing something just, you know, in the discretionary realm, I'm saying, you know, separate from the mandatory realm, the discretionary realm is where all the magic happens. The odds of you getting them to swim in that discretionary pool is basically zero. If they think you're stupid or, or whatever, because people at the end of the day are going to respond to incentives. But if you can frame it in a way where it's saying, hey, what you want is what I want. And what I want is to help you do your job better and easier and let you run faster. Well, that's a much different conversation to have. Yeah, yeah, totally well said. That's exactly what I'm, I'm trying to do. When you can reach this point where you have a common objective, then, then it's, um, yeah, it's a pleasure. <laughs> why, do you think, why do you think that in and of itself is an innovation in compliance? Why do folks have such a hard time doing what, you, what seems to be so natural for you? I think maybe from the, from the history of compliance uh, first, because um, so co I would say compliance was um, uh, managed by legal or HR representative. And if I talk about my, my legal friends, um, the, what, what, I, what I think is legal is mostly in large corporation, very uh, reactive and protective of the company. Okay. okay. Compliance, compliance 2.0, compliance 2.0 is not reactive, it's uh, preventive. Right. Okay. So the history was, yeah, oh, there is an issue. We need to react. We need to investigate. We need to sanction. We need to train. Okay. Um, and so it was very defensive. Okay. It, um, now, I think, um, and I, I read a lot of, of books and listen to a lot of people about that is to to prevent mm -hmm. and to be and to and to avoid uh, issues from from happening, and to to do that the only way to do that is to is to first to have the buy-in of the top management, and again to have the buy-in of the top management is to you need to have the compliance program being embedded into the corporate strategy. Right. Okay. And I can give you an example. Um, if if today um, we have customers that wants a product that uh, respect um, respect uh, uh, ESG concerns or yeah. corruption concerns, or and all all the customers don't want to buy a product that are manufactured by child, for instance. Um, so you need you need to to be at the center of the conversation with with the supply chain, with the yep. vendors, with salespeople, saying, okay, here is what we do. How are we going to communicate about it? Um, and then and then compliance uh, become at the heart of the corporate strategy, not uh, not the, the not the last thing we we think about when we when we talk about strategy. Yeah, and um, so on that note, do you feel like the entrance of ESG into this conversation, I mean, this is now in the global conversation. This is an acronym everybody is talking about and everybody knows now. Do you think the entrance of that into the conversation makes it easier to translate the potential impact compliance can have on an organization to the top management who maybe historically has looked at compliance as this back office thing? Yeah, definitely, because they see it as a marketing tool. They see Great. it as a... So what you want is what I want, to your point. Yeah, exactly. So for me, that's a, that's a golden opportunity that we cannot miss. 100%. Yeah. Yeah, I'm super excited about this. I know ESG has been out for a long time, and people have been talking about, uh, you know, a stakeholder approach versus shareholder approach for many, many years. Whatever. It's here now. So it's being talked about now more. And I just think, in general, I think you can win any hand of poker with any hand, you know, you can win any pot of poker with any hand you're uh, given if you play it right. And this is a great yeah. hand that we've been given because if we can play it right, it's very easy to translate the efforts that we're trying to do to release 
uh, the magic of the workforce and to be that circulatory system of the organization and make sure that, hey, we're, we're really living out uh, the values that we espouse on our website and our marketing materials and, and, and so forth. But putting it in those marketing terms, it's just kind of interesting uh, putting it in those marketing terms from uh, the perspective of those executives at the top who maybe haven't historically thought a lot about compliance is a very, very powerful move. Yeah, no, it's, it's a powerful. But uh, Nick, marketing doesn't mean uh, false. It needs a, I get it. We need to have a paper. We 100%. need to have a real strong uh, and meaning it. Uh, but um, yeah, I think it's a, it's a golden opportunity. And, and if, if we look at the last five years, um, we had the, the, the Me Too movement, mm -hmm. okay, which has a link with compliance because it's a, it's a workplace misconduct. Um, uh, we have diversity and inclusion, mm -hmm. and of course ESG. Also, all those topics, um, if you frame them right, um, you can again find a common ground, common objective with uh, uh, with marketing, with communication, uh, with sales, and of course with the CEO. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's. I don't know why it's been easy for you, and I'd love to kind of dive into that. And maybe easy is the wrong word, but you're somebody who's gained a lot of traction um, within your own organization to push these changes and push these innovations. What would you attribute it to? Would you, would you attribute it to your ability to kind of have the yin and the yang, the numbers and the people? Is it your, uh, you can speak numbers and so you can always tie that down to something objective that, the, you know, are the dollars and cents that the executive's thinking about? What do you think it is that has, al that has allowed you to kind of be, to have more dexterity with respect to driving change in the organization versus being crippled or not seeing the opportunity that some of these things, Me Too, Inclusion, ESG, have presented in terms of magnifying the impact of compliance? Um, I think I, I understood one one thing that uh, that um, people wants to hear about themselves and uh, and so my, my approach was not to ask people to do things. My approach was to understand people and and make, make them talk, and then as and when they talk and when they. they Telling me um, what are their pressure points, mm -hmm. uh, what are their uh, KPIs, mm -hmm. um, all the difficulties they have in their work, or their objectives. Then, by knowing their environment, I can always always find one little uh, topic or task mm -hmm. which is linked to my compliance program, and Maybe. this is this is how I get traction. Yeah, again, it's so simple, but it's so powerful, right? You're speaking pain points. You're speaking their language. You've taken the time to understand where they're coming from and what their world actually looks like. So instead of doing a, you know, a top-down dictate or a top-down mandate that says you must do this, you're really kind of going bottom-up and on a person-by-person -person basis, at least at some level, maybe it's even just the manager level. Um, yeah. Understanding that, again, can allow you to hook uh, what your agenda to a pain point they are feeling to drive an outcome that's going to be mutually beneficial and, you know, hopefully beneficial broadly across the organization and, you know, the community that you're in. Yeah, that's exactly what I, what I do. Yeah. Um, and that just kind of comes naturally to you because you're a people person and you, I mean, you started this conversation out by saying one of the things that interests you most is people, how they make decisions, how they respond to incentives and what those incentives and decision-making patterns you know, or I guess how those things lead to the outcomes that that may be in in question. So it's kind of a natural thing for you. Yeah, of this and also the fact that I like to know how it how anything works. And I'm from a very complex uh, supply chain, the semiconductor industry, where there's a lot of it's very, very difficult to understand. Yeah. And so because I've got this natural um, curiosity, I would yeah. say to understand, OK, so this department, what what do they do? How how does how does this connect to, to that? And, how, and so just to have this curiosity of understanding, I would say the business, mm -hmm. uh, I think um, yeah, was a, um, brought a lot of, of values to to my compliance work. Yeah, because I guess like if you're naturally curious, then when you're having that conversation with somebody and the questions you're asking 
I mean, when you're having that conversation, the questions you're asking are are authentic because you're authentically trying to understand yeah, this person. Understand. So again, versus just kind of going through a list of, hey, I'm going to ask you about how was your day. I'm going to ask you about, you know what I'm saying? You're having an actual conversation. You're building an actual connection with them. Yeah. And it's fueled by that natural curiosity you have. You know, as I was thinking about this, um, or as you were talking, I was thinking about this role of a compliance ambassador. And I understand in the context of your business, how that was a, another hat that you had to put on as a finance person. But um, I don't know the extent to which the average compliance department is thinking about having this sort of ambassador function. That is maybe it's a person who has a personality type that's, you know, that's resonant with this type of work, but understanding and making those connections and driving that persuasion on a person to person level is really the way to start crowdsourcing risk management and getting up that curve in a parabolic way to magnify that impact. But it's such a powerful thing. And, you know, again, at the end of the day, we are not a bunch of people staring at screens, typing words on on a page. We're human beings making decisions and we're working with other hum, human beings and relying on this on this vast complex network that exists in every organization to get that organization's mission done. So pulling it from the rules and the regulations down to the individual level just allows for 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 so much. And I think we could probably talk about that, uh, f- you know, forever. Um, but let me ask you this. How is the compliance team uh, that you've been a part of uniquely positioned, you think, to drive empathy in a strong culture without throughout the organization. You know, a lot of time is spent talking about the regulations and the rules and so forth, but I think actualizing the workforce and when compliance can expand their mandate to releasing the power in the workforce or, or releasing the magic in the workforce, that can drive a lot of, you know, value within the organization. So how do you think about that kind of impact uh, on, you know, driving a strong culture and how do you think, and how do you think we can help expand the scope of compliance more quickly to encapsulate this piece of the puzzle? That's a difficult question. Um, there's a lot to say. So do, do you want to talk about empathy? Yeah, let's, let's start there. I think that's kind of the life language that we all speak, you know? Yeah. Um, if you want to talk about empathy, so don't talk about rules or do or do not pronounce the word must or must not. That's, um, you know, one of my, of my friend and uh, my former GC was, was always telling me, do not lecture people. Yeah. Okay. And it's, and this is how I see my, my job. I'm not here to tell people what to do and what not to do. And I've never done it and I will not I'll do it in, in the future. Uh, my role is to, create awareness and saying, did you think about that? Or did you think about that? Or do you know that there is this risk? And when, when you come up with an, an attitude, uh, which is, um, look, Nick, I'm going to protect you. Because if you do that, you might be in trouble. Right. Uh, did you think about that? If, if you come up with this attitude of protecting people and the company, then you drive empathy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Again, again, it's so simple. But people divorce this empathy from their day-to-day lives, especially within businesses oftentimes, and especially when they're dealing with departments that they don't know or people that's just, a, a, you know, it, it's just the person is not a person. It's just an email address or it's just a, a name on a line on a spreadsheet or something. You know what I'm saying? There's a person behind that name who has their own difficulties and their own life and their own challenges and their own goals and whatever, right? And connecting with that is way more powerful than, to your point, just lecturing at somebody and speaking at them instead of speaking with them. Yeah, exactly. And I made, um, you know, I, I, I put a mantra on my program. Uh, for, I called it a speaker pr- a program. And I can give you some tips that I, Please. I was always, yeah, yes. I was always doing. Like any single question, any single question on any single topic, even if it was outside my scope, I would take the time to first to answer fast within 24 hours and understand the background. And it was, I, I would pick up the phone and really talk to the person because for me, any single conversation, any single contact with compliance was just for me, an opportunity to, to know better the business. Yeah. To, to, to learn from, from uh, to learn a new, a new risk or a new topic. So, so for me, that was something extremely, extremely important. 
Yeah, and again, that's fueled by your natural curiosity and your desire to connect with people and to understand, again, different avenues and different, uh, you know, places that you can strategically make things different. Yes, and usually when, when I read papers or articles, the way compliance is presented well, is, yeah, compliance could be the one uh, drafting the code of conduct and then uh, communicating the code of conduct to the whole organization and making sure that the code of conduct is known, and which is something which is very important. Yeah. But for me, the, the, the next level of compliance is not compliance uh, addressing, lecturing, giving lessons. It's the other way around. It's people, um, people talking to compliance and say, uh, oh, what about that? Or what about that? And then compliance will, will learn from people. And this is especially true with, with COVID, where people are working from home, mm -hmm. where it's impossible for me uh, in front of my laptop uh, to know what's happening yeah, in Mexico. Right. Yeah, good point. I can't, I cannot, it's impossible. Right. So I need people to come and talk to me and tell me what's happening on the ground and, and raise my awareness. And based on that, I can I can derive controls, trainings, rules uh, to prevent. But uh, this is I, I I yeah I reverse the flow. Yeah, people right. will talk to me, and I will act on based on people on what people are telling me. So I love I love that reframe. Because uh, you hear a lot of people complain about how this work from home environment is so hard to navigate. It sounds like you've kind of taken advantage of that and used it as opportunities to make connections with people in Mexico or wherever else um, to get those additional insights, not only on a sort of a macro basis, but also on a micro basis in terms of what they're dealing with in this new normal. That's really great. Yeah. yeah. And I can give you one, one thing, um, uh, one activity we, we did, and I was... Uh, I was very happy because it, the result was completely unexpected. Um, we started a, uh, a program. Uh, we So we looked at the numbers. I'm a big fan of numbers. Mm -hmm. And we saw that most of our questions and complaints uh, related were well, related to workplace misconduct, whether mm -hmm. it's uh, a feeling of being bullied or discrimination or harassment and so based on that, we conducted a risk assessment and we came up with, um, with a training, a virtual training on Zoom, uh, where instead of me or anybody from, so somebody from HR, from legal, uh, presenting uh, a PowerPoint and rules and, and laws and sanction and risk, um, what we did is we, um, we showed uh, a video of a case, of a real case, okay? Uh, it was related to diversity and inclusion or, or harassment. And we asked people uh, to, to tell us what is the best way to avoid that in the company or ah. that or what would they do, okay? And they came up with the best answer that I would have never thought about. Um, so for me, that was also eye opener. Yeah. I mean, that does a couple of things, right? That is, uh, you're, you're not giving people the answer. You're letting them go through it and think about it themselves. And you're getting some of that benefit of the magic of the crowd, right? Crowdsourcing yeah. an idea. It's, it's just a way to get people to engage and get, get some benefit of the diversity that's built into the business. I mean, there's, there's diversity, on the fact that there's just different people, let alone the different backgrounds, different races, whatever. So that's, that's phenomenal. That's a, again, you know, I always talk about this when I talk to like a compliance innovator, because you know, they present these ideas like this that are super interesting, super effective. And yet they're always, they always seem to be so, so simple. We're talking about, yeah. Hey, this is something that happened. What would you do? And then you're crowdsourcing all this stuff. And now someone has put themselves in the picture and thought through it on a deeper level versus just sort of uh, disengaged, watching a screen, clicking through, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. The only difficulty I had is something also, um, it wasn't scalable. So it was very good and we had good feedback. But uh, the next step is to find, uh, to engage people, uh, but finding a, a way to do it uh, 
on a, on a more scalable basis. But that's <laughs> yeah. How uh, let's let's talk about that for a minute because that's an interesting problem. Like, how have you thought about increasing the scalability, or how have you thought about capturing that sort of crowdsourcing thing, or that sort of essentially a Socratic method of conveying a compliance topic on a more broader uh, yeah. basis? The, I think the most, uh, the easiest way to do it, to get information from the from the, from um, from a, a workforce which is spread over uh, all over the world, is survey. Ah, yeah, that's that's the best, and all compliance survey. Um, and um, and if I quote um, a good good friend that I really, really admire, uh, Eugene Soltes. Even if you send a survey and you ask those three questions, um, have you, have you not, uh, were you, did you see any compliance issue in the last quarter, in the last 12 months? Um, did you report it? And if not, uh, why didn't you report it? Just this kind of small surveys. Um, I think this is a, the, the, the best yeah, the most efficient tool. Yeah, to scale. Um, yeah. Do you guys do those kinds of things, or how have you seen them work, and how have you seen them fall flat? We, um, so we didn't do it consistently. That's one of my regrets. I think yeah. this can be powerful if it, um, uh, if well done. What what I what I see uh, in terms of uh, employee survey. For, for, um, I think the um, the way it could be better is do it um, often. Okay, mm. if you do it every every two years or three years, um, it's not going to work because it's just one at one point. So you need to do it um, uh, maybe every quarter, like financial statements. Great okay. point. Yeah, it needs to be short. It needs to be. Uh, um, analyzed on a location basis or country basis or department basis. Um, and, and, and it can be a rotating survey. Maybe, uh, maybe one quarter you're going to survey, I don't know, uh, New York and this, the second quarter you're going to survey Seattle and then you're going to survey Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think um, uh, this, this, this can bring a lot of values. Yeah. Yeah, I love that idea. Uh, keeping it short and getting enough data points so that you can actually get a trend line that is not just wrought with, you know, errors. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Or false positives, false negatives, whatever. Um, because, you know, again, the workforce itself is changing all the time and the respondents are changing and the perceptions are changing and the initiatives are changing. There's all this change going on in the, the organization. And that's why, you know, to go back to your financial statement um, analogy, that's why you need both a balance sheet and a cash or that's why you need a balance sheet and a PL so you can see the snapshots, but you can also see the flows and how are things changing from, from, from time to time. You need those two dimensions to get a clearer picture of the financial health of the organization, right? The same way that having these repeated data points allows you to start to chart lines and understand and cut those in different uh, dimensions to see, you know, do I have a, a risk hotspot over here or is, you know, is this wheel squeaking that needs a little bit of oil or we need some more training or we need some more controls in place or whatever. Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah, and today, I, I, from what I know, from what I read, I, I think um, compliance is far from that. Uh, I agree with you. Yeah, by, by lack of budget, first, um, yeah, by lack of budget and and understanding, and we, I think we are still, um, yeah. If 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 you compare compliance, how we use data compared to marketing, right. Of course, finance, we are just so far. But again, that creates a massive opportunity. If we're not using data right, or if we're not using data to the extent that some of these other departments in our organizations are using it, well, that's all upside. That's all, you know, yeah. potential benefits that, that we're just not reaping yet. You know what I'm saying? So let's talk a little bit about that because you talked about the budget piece and they don't have the budget and whatever. What advice would you give somebody who's maybe a little bit different than you? Maybe they don't have that finance background. Maybe they're not as much of an extrovert or as much of a people person. What advice would you give them, though, to help get them that budget they need from the person that controls the purse strings, whether that's the CFO or ultimately the CEO? What advice would you give them to, to 
influence the, those people to get the budget they need to prove themselves? Um, I, I think what what I what what what, has, uh, what worked with me is to you, you know in any organization compliance teams are very small compared to other teams mm -hmm. very small okay so you need to find partners either uh, at HR or legal or communication and then um, once you find a partner maybe you can you can kind of carpool if I can say it. Okay. yeah yeah uh, I, I can give you an example um, we recently we used a tool that was uh, for sure maybe too expensive for the sole compliance department but there was another department using this tool for data privacy so we Got said it. oh by the way could we use your tool uh, and we maybe we would share the, the cost and then that, that's it so you need to find um, you need to find partners uh, uh, I can give you another example we we shot a video uh, of top executives uh, to serve as a as a tone from the top as an introduction of one of our training okay great I didn't have the budget to have professional uh, uh, editor and, and 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 videographer so I and but communication had I said yeah would you <laughs> would you lend me some of your uh, budget uh, to to do that and so they find a they found a win because it's internal communication right okay. right it's top executives talking to employees so that's their work and I found a win also with my with my program on having a tone from the top so the, you you need to find allies and partners right uh, and to do that you need to understand what they are doing and and yeah and yeah. I mean, you have to have conversations people. with these people. You have to reach out to them, first of all, yeah. but you have to sort of correspondingly understand that these opportunities are there throughout the entire organization. There, there yeah. are apples on the orchard room floor or on the orchard floor that you can just pick up. These are ripe apples. These are not rotted out. They're right there for you. You talk about low-hanging fruit. These are even lower than the low-hanging fruit. But it just mm -hmm. takes building a, building a relationship. And it, building a relationship does not mean courting it doesn't mean you have to date somebody for nine months to get a favor. It just means yeah. a couple of conversations to understand what's going on in their world, to find that that overlap between their purpose and your purpose or their agenda and your agenda to link arms and get that get that cross pollination in place. I mean, that's a total win win. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I've seen a lot of people, um, you know, innovate in this department and particularly around like you know, this is not 1990 anymore where to get a video shot, you need to bring in a film crew and do all that stuff. I've seen people even just use their cell phones, which have really nice cameras on them now. Uh, they're way better than, you know, what you'd have to spend thousands of dollars on for a standalone camera, you know, five or seven years ago. But just having something, something tangible, something new, something innovative that can, again, magnify that message if you can get somebody uh, from the top to speak that. Um, or, again, utilize some of these other resources. But it all starts with people. It all starts with conversations, and it all starts with those empathy, those you know, empathy-based relationships, essentially. Yeah. So let's go. Uh, I always love to ask these two questions. So I'd love for you to first tell me, looking into your crystal ball, we're ten years in the future. It's twenty thirty-one. How has compliance changed? How has its role and its um, its reputation in our organizations changed? That's the first question. And then the second question is, let's let's hop in the way back machine and go back and find the young you. What piece of advice would you give would you give him? So first <laughs> forward looking and then we're going to go back in time. So forward looking um So, um, how would compliance would be in, in 2031? Um, as we, I, I really believe in the, uh, the term co-build. Okay. Yeah. So, um, it's like, um, do, do you have, uh, you know, in France, we have a, um, a party, a political party called, uh, the green, which is ecology. Okay. Yeah. This shouldn't be a party. This should be. This should be a it matter should be everybody. of everyone. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So compliance will be the same. Got it. So, 
compliance will be the expert, but every single employee would have their integrity, their, 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 would, would bring to the table. Okay. So we would be the one helping and driving and no supporting, yeah. but pe people would come and say, what about, what about, um, equal pay between women and, and, and men? And they would propose something and would help and would help. So, so there wouldn't, there wouldn't be maybe a department, mm -hmm. but the drive would come from the employees themselves. That's yeah. And I mean, what we're talking about is ethics. We're talking about an ethical workplace. Who doesn't want an ethical workplace? You know, we're not trying to teach fish to, to fly. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. We're trying to teach fish, fish to swim. They want to swim. And so empowering them and, and help, you know, helping them to understand that the ethical work, you know, ethics should be easy. Us having an ethical workplace should be easy. And this is what you actually want. It's, it's, it's just not that difficult. You know, if you can give people the track to run on, they're going to run a lot faster to your point than you think. So I love that. I love that picture. And that's kind of my vision as well. <laughs> and the, the second thing we, that we touch uh, a bit is harnessing as a data and using the data to prevent, uh, to prevent wrongdoing. And there's, uh, some work which is which is being done and now um, I, I can give you some some examples of, of activities that are being done like for instance tra traveling expenses okay today we have all the tools to to drill down all the transactions right whether it's a flight ticket a taxi taxi fares um, hotel rooms okay and you could for instance give uh design a profile of of how much this type of function should spend during uh during one year okay and instead of as a compliance waiting for uh, somebody not respecting the travel policy you would have a, a, a dashboard and saying oh mr or mrs why she's way out of mm -hmm. the profile we we design based on, on a functional mr x uh, this person is not uh, should 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 travel much more and have a higher budget. Something is happening. So, right. like this, instead of coming up with a one size fits all training or policy, we would use the data and identify red flags to see if there is something wrong or not. That's so. That's yeah, I how love that. I do, yeah, uh, the future of compliance. You know, it's um, you know, when you think back to the compliance one point oh framework, it's kind of equivalent, you know, like you said, it's very reactionary, right? Um, yeah. And it's not necessarily fixing the, a systemic problem. It is just reacting to a, pro a problem. It's trying to put out a fire. Um, and there you, you know, I don't know if you've read about these cases, but you know, when, when people uh, were really overweight in the past, they would go and get like uh, that, that stomach stapling surgery. Well, many of those people would end up reverting to being very overweight after that surgery because the systemic problem of their diet and their lifestyle and their just general mm -hmm. like healthiness was never fixed. So that surgery ended up not really doing anything. I think what you're talking about is let's, let's use this data to, to change our lifestyle to one that is really healthy so we never have to get to the point where we have to get our stomach stapled. I, I love that vision. Yeah, so that's what I, um, I would like to see. Um, in the future, uh, but I think it's coming. <laughs> I do. I, I think it's coming too. We're, we're getting those tools to your point. We have the data there, you know, <laughs> folks right now are swimming in these data lakes. We need to sort of be able to, you know, find the story in this data and find the story, you know, and turn this data into actual information that we can act on versus just like spinning through spreadsheets and, you know, having nothing, you know, no output that, that is any, you know, that has any real meaning. Mm, I agree. All right, so let's go back in time now. Let's find uh, the so, young version of you. What advice I, think would I, you did, give? I, I, I did what I had to do. So, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, an advice that I could give to my sons is to um, every, and I really believe in it. Every single piece of job, everything, every activity you do is and uh, very very interesting it's all about the mindset you have mm. it's all about that. and let me give you an example during uh, four years uh, the only thing i did was accounting and tax okay 
Now, Nick, how many people do you know that, fi that find accounting and tax interesting? Not many. Not many. Okay. I, I found it very interesting because people are just looking at numbers and spreadsheet and or form to fill. But if you, if you change your mindset and say, okay, oh, there is this tax. Why a bunch of people worked many hours to have this tax being structured this way mm -hmm. and the company being taxed this way. Okay. If you, if you think about the history, if you think about how to, and people are doing that, how to optimize or how to make it, how to do it um, quicker or how the link between this number and this number, then what my point is broadening uh, the skills and, and taking every single activity not as a boring activity, but as something which is just bigger than that. Mm -hmm. Okay. When you do that, um, you you are just building uh, dots and you are just accumulating uh, knowledge. Right. But in the future, you're going to see that um, you you will find a connection. You will that's find right. a connection. And that's 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 a, uh, that's what what I think is very interesting. And uh, I can give you another example. One day, I've been invited to work on counterfeit product. Okay, and oh, wow. I didn't know anything about the product first and about counterfeiting, and but I was the only person available. So, first of all, I studied it. I spent a week to study about counterfeit uh, semiconductors, and I found it super interesting, very interesting. And then uh, this. And this just this work was uh, the reason why I've been picked as head of compliance because interesting I was I was known and accepted this, this role. So I think every single piece of go. work needs to be, you example. need to take it, take it, take it, take it, and then you 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 find connection and um, yeah, that's yeah, my it, advice. that's a great mindset. I mean, there's truly opportunity in everything, and yeah. as you build this sort of lattice in your mind of all these different areas that you've learned about these connections just naturally begin to form and you can bring a really um you know some you know a, a really nuanced solution that you know otherwise you would probably miss out on you know exactly. i didn't even know about uh counterfeit semiconductors that's a that's a whole thing huh it's a whole industry yeah but it's counterfeit for everything for yeah perfume, i guess you're right for, for everything and and yeah that, that's yeah. a counterfeit fire behind me <laughs> exactly <laughs> that's crazy i'd love to uh learn some more about that well, listen man i love your work i love uh your heart and your passion uh, i've learned a lot in this conversation this is really a lot of fun tell us where people can find you where can they reach out to you and learn learn more about you linkedin is the best yeah you, you can find me on on linkedin all right well thanks again for joining us man this was this was a blast thank you very much nick all right until next time <laughs>